Thank you very much. Hello. Uh Development Control Committee meeting. My name is Councillor Omid Miri. I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, just to go through some uh, housekeeping points in our new venue. This meeting is being live streamed to the council's YouTube channel. So by participating, you are consenting to being recorded. If the fire alarm sounds, either continuously or intermittently, I'll adjourn the meeting. Please leave the meeting in an orderly fashion by the staff fire exit, which is behind me to my right, and officers will direct you to the assembly point in Riverside Gardens. There are tea, coffee, and biscuits available in the staff kitchen next to the reception, and the toilets are on my left hand side, and you will need your Hammersmith and Fulham security badge to gain access. I'll move on to item one, which is apologies for absence, and I do have apologies for absence from Councillor Rebecca Harvey. That can be noted, please. Moving on to item two, declaration of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Item three, minutes of the meeting held on 16th of January, 2024. Are the minutes agreed? Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. And that brings us to item four, which is Albert Wharf and Swedish Wharf. And can I please ask Roy Asakba Power to introduce the report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> So um, before we start, I'd just like to draw members' attention to the addendum, which has some corrections uh, to the report. Uh, the most significant change on there is probably the introduction of condition 30 to replace the existing one shown on the agenda. It relates to control of transport industrial noise. We had a late letter today from, I think yes, or yesterday evening, from Semex on the adjoining site at Comley's. Uh, raising concerns about uh, noise uh, implications of their proposal on future occupiers. So that condition has been adapted to take account of that. Uh, we also had some concerns raised in that same letter uh, about navigation and whether or not it was appropriate for the committee to make a decision on the application at this time. Um, just to confirm, the application uh, has been subject to statutory consultation, which involved the pub the Port of London Authority, who are the statutory authority for the river uh, navigation. Uh, and uh, they have considered the proposals together with the um, environment statement, together with a uh, submission that was provided to them for a provisional navigation assessment. Uh, they are satisfied that um, the information they've been provided with is sufficient for them to be able to make a recommendation. And they have recommended that the application uh, be, or rather they raise no objection subject to a condition being attached and that condition is attached uh, on the agenda tonight um, and it comes from their recommended wording okay um, the other things are just to note um, there should be a building control monitoring condition attached to the agenda this is a verbal um, uh, addition I do apologize uh, late in the day uh, and also there should be a condition about a um, district heat network uh, being attached to a district heat network in the future that has been agreed with the applicant is something that we were seeking and it's something that's referred to in the report it just wasn't picked up in the conditions so thank you very much great <coughs> well, now we will, i'll now move on to the presentation so this site relates to the albert wharf and swedish wharf on wandrapid road uh, the application has been in for some time and the subjects of much um Consultation discussions at pre-app and application stage. Um, so I'll just take you through some images. So proposals uh, is to demolish the buildings on the sites uh, and any structures. The proposed developments or replacement buildings will comprise six uh, new buildings uh, ranging from five to 17 stories in height. Uh, significantly, the safeguarded wharf uh, will be retained uh, and will be retained for flexible general industrial storage distribution use. Uh, in connection with a waterborne cargo handling and freight uh, and some ancillary offices. Uh, above that, we'll sit uh, 276 residential dwellings with ancillary uh, communal floor space. There would also be on the podium level, a cafe restaurant, uh, as well as the, an extension to the Thames Path, which will be in an elevated form. That will be accessible by lift and stairs from Wandsworth Bridge Road. There's also a proposed new jetty, which I've touched on already. Um, and then also there will be uh, some communal and private amenity space and landscaping together with uh, vehicular access and new vehicular access servicing facilities, cars and cycle parking and other plant and associated works. 
This is the application site that you can see on the screen. Uh, it's basically highlighted in red. And uh, what you have is the both sites highlighted in red uh, fronting um, the river to the south. Uh, the safeguarded wharf overlaps with part of the site because the Comedy's Wharf next door is also safeguarded. So the two sites together are safeguarded wharfs. Uh, you've also got uh, Sands End Conservation Area, which is highlighted in green and where the site sits. Uh, and then to the north, you can see another green area, which is the Studridge Street Conservation Area. This is an aerial photograph, which hopefully helps to sort of illustrate uh, the context of surroundings. Uh, so you've got Wandsworth Bridge Road to the south and the river to the south. Uh, the site obviously highlighted in red, Albert and Swedish. So you've got an open area, which is hard standing, um, which is essentially the protected wharf. And to the left of that, you've got a uh, wharf which is not protected, uh, but has been had some temporary uses on it, uh, including a bar. Uh, but it's lawful uses as in auk for auctioning cars. Uh, to the left of the site or to the west is the Hurlingham Retail Park site, which has been subject to a planning permission that was granted back in 2015. It's currently under construction, albeit at slow pace. Um, it uh, basically includes some five to 13 storey buildings uh, with, with uh, um, commercial at ground floor and some residential above. Uh, you've also got... Uh, sorry. You've also got to the... East uh, Fulham Wharf site, which has been phase one development, which is basically um, above the Tesco's, which is on Townmead Road. That includes buildings up to 15, 16 storeys. Uh, and then you've got Comley's Wharf, which is immediately to the east, which is the Semex uh, batch concrete batching plant. And to the north, I should say, there's a frontage on to the north on Townmead Road. Um, this is a view looking south from, if effectively from Townmead Road. You can see the river obviously in the in the background, and you've got the site which is hard standing. Just to the left, you've got an office building which is the on the Conley site, but much of it is is relatively open. And then to the further to the east is the um, Fulham Wharf site, which has the same use breeze at a lower level and residential above, and it's got some landscape areas facing the river as well. And then to the west, on the right-hand side of this image, you've got the Hurlingham uh, Park, Retail Park site. Uh, this image is really just trying to highlight where the Thames path is at the moment. If you look at the top image, uh, on the left-hand side, you've got the Hurlingham Retail Park car park, as it were. And just to the south of that, you've got a footpath which runs along the frontage of the river, but then culminates effectively like a cul-de-sac going nowhere. Uh, you can see that in the image on the bottom right. Uh, and then if you look at the image on the bottom left, uh, there's some arrows highlighted in green, which highlight the what I've just tried to describe. You've got the Hurlingham Retail Park on the left-hand side of the bridge, where there's a footpath, Thames path. But then across the frontage of the site, there's currently no path because you can't access it anywhere publicly. There's no footpath, and the proposal will involve the introduction of a footpath with an elevated form along that stretch of the site. Uh, and then beyond that, you've got Conley's Wharf, which has no access to uh, the public. Uh, and then beyond that is the uh, Fulham Wharf site, which does have a footpath. So this is just taking account of um, the uh, policy designation of the site. So Swedish Wharf is a protected wharf that falls within the site, which means it's safeguarded for freight and cargo handling uh, as identified in ministerial guidance and in the London plan. Uh, and that's reflected in local plan policies. Uh, also, as it happens, the site adjacent Comley's Wharf is a safeguarded wharf as well. And they're only one of the two of a number, limited number in the borough. Um, you've got here this image, which again, just trying to highlight sort of context for you. Uh, the South Fulham Riverside Regeneration Area is highlighted in yellow. Um, that was kind of designated around about 2013. You've got the Sands End Conservation Area highlighted in pink. And the site itself falls into both of those areas, as well as falling into the Thames Policy Area, which is a wider area which stretches along the river. Notably, as far as the uh, South Fulham Riverside Regeneration Area is concerned, the emphasis on trying to make use of underused sites and reconnect them with the community uh, with the river also it's targeting 4,000 new homes 500 new jobs uh, it's appropriate location for tall buildings 
particularly high density development close to um, Wandsworth Bridge Road Junction, which is where this location, site location is located. Uh, Sands End Conservation Area was designated in 1991, uh, but significantly the area has changed quite a bit since that uh, South Fulham Riverside uh, area was designated. It's got much more of a new character. There's much more greater scale and taller buildings. And the important thing just to highlight in this is that um, the Thames policy area seeks to optimise development on underused sites. This is just providing you with a context. So the top left image, all of these sites uh, fall within the South Fulham Riverside area. The site at the top is actually the site for discussion tonight, which uh, included Albert and Swedish. But a development that was granted in 2015 also included the Comley site. So that would have been the concrete batching site. Um, so you can see from that, there's, you know, uh, uh, if you like, a, a push towards um, taller buildings. Similarly, you've got on the opposite side, the um, Hurlingham Retail Park. Again, you've got buildings up in that, which are taller, up to 12 storeys. And then to the east, which I mentioned previously, uh, beyond the Comedy site, you've got Fulham Wharf, which again, you've got these um, tall buildings up to 16 storeys. And that's all part of the character, emerging character of this um, particular location in the South Fulham Riverside, where tall buildings are deemed as appropriate. This is just showing a block plan to show where the proposed new buildings would go. So there are six new buildings, the two on the frontage, which are the taller ones, two mid blocks, uh, which are called mansion blocks, and then the rear block, uh, which is fronting Town Mead Road, drops down to um, five storeys. It's just trying to show a bit of context. So you've got the building that was approved on the left hand side in yellow, which is the Hurling and Retail Park, the proposed building in blue. Uh, and then you've got the buildings to the right, which are existing. You've got obviously the uh, Conley's Wharf, which is a relatively vacant site, but um, it's not part of this development. So this is proposed along the river frontage. You can see the building has a, a base, if you like, and that's where the wharf would be. So it's basically like a uh, a box, if you like, uh, with a, a sealed box to stop noise going upwards. And you can see on this elevation, you've got a gap between the podium level where these on this left hand side that's the Wandsworth Bridge Road level you've got some publicly accessible steps which go up to a podium and then above that you can see there's a gap between uh, the residential uh, which is provided above and that is intended to try and help insulate those properties from noise but also uh, to ensure that the wharf continue to be a working wharf um, that's similarly for the smaller buildings so the building on the left is 17 stories the building on the right is 13 stories this is a CGI showing the same sort of thing, basically, but hopefully in a sort of more helpful format. You can see that um, the wharf box is at the base. You've got the stairs which go up to the podium. And above that, you've got some space, which is uh, airspace, which is, again, providing a bit of uh, buffer between the wharf and the residential. But it's also an area that's for uh, publicly accessible uh, as amenity space. Uh, and there would also be a cafe restaurant in this location as well. And you can see how the building steps down as you go north towards Talmud Road on that sort of uh, western elevation. Frozen, sorry, it's just frozen. There we go. Yeah, so this is basically more of the western elevation. So you've got the building at the front, which is the taller 17 storey on Wandsworth Bridge Road, and you've got these uh, called mansion blocks in the middle, with balconies and uh, large windows to sort of break up the facade. And you've got some infill um, buildings in between, which are slightly different brick, but again, just try and break up the, the mass of the building. And it steps down as you go towards Talmead Road. So here we are. So you've got the... Orsonosia building, which is an existing building on the corner, which is a showroom for a furniture showroom. The elevations facing uh, east and south uh, do not contain any glazing or anything, you know, uh, which is glass, which should be impacted. All the glazing is on the elevation fronting Wands of Bridge Road and um, Talmud Road, as shown in the image. So there are no elevations to the side or to the rear that would be impacted. This is just showing you the elevation on Townmead Road. So essentially, when this was originally submitted, there were plans to have a, a sort of a, a seven-story element along this frontage. Um, 
and that has been reduced. And the image on the right hand side is where we've arrived at basically a five story um, building on that Tower Mead Road frontage with building setback behind that. And that's to mitigate the daylight and sunlight concerns which we had during the course of the application. It's just showing you some images of the proposed floor space so you can see the sort of central air which is the, the largest air if you like in gray which is the the wharf at uh, ground floor level you've got a vehicular access on town mead road which serves the rear of the site and provides fire access as well you've also got a separate uh, access for the wharf uh, to the middle here which is actually for uh, disabled parking there are nine spaces proposed and three loading bays the areas in yellow just highlight the access points are residential above Uh, this is the first floor so significantly the wharf itself has quite a high ceiling so there's a whole huge void above that wharf but you've got cycle storage spaces around which is ancillary to the residential at this level uh, and you've got some offices on the sort of this image uh, in the lighter blue color which is ancillary to the wharf this is the proposed second floor so what you see here is some residential starting to appear uh, on the block C at the back and the blocks fronting Monsworth Bridge Road and then adjacent to the site at uh, Semex. There's a setback of between five and a half and just 10 metres uh, to that boundary. Uh, then you've got, uh, yes, sorry, this um, private amenity space in the middle, which is a courtyard area basically for the residents of the development. Then we move upwards again to the third floor. You start to see more residential, but significantly, this is a uh, amenity space that's publicly available. Uh, so the steps, which are in a previous image from Wandsworth Bridge Road, which take you up onto this sort of podium area above the wharf, this is where it leads to, uh, and it's publicly accessible uh, for everyone, so anyone can go up there. There's obviously been through a range of consultation with the Met Police about CCTV, antisocial behaviour, etc. Uh, there's also a commercial unit which is a restaurant located in this blue area here highlighted so it's kind of an inviting area for people to actually enjoy and be able to observe the river activities from that location this is just showing essentially the two landscaped areas which i just mentioned the top image is the um, public area which is adjacent to the river uh, and um, has the cafe and this is the more enclosed area which is more private for the residents on the bottom so just showing you the roof sort of arrangements. So you've got sort of uh, solar panels and plant, etc. It's just showing a cross section. So the top image is Tower Mead Road is on the left and the river is on the right and the buildings, they step up towards the river. And you've got a base of different types of uses within that. So you've got plants, you've got access points and you've got cycle storage and you've got residential above that. Similarly on the ground, sorry, on the second image below, it's just flipping it the other way around, looking uh, west. So you've got the river at the front and Tammy Road on the right. And again, it's just looking through the site so you can see where the safeguarded wharf would be and the residential, how it relates to that. This is just trying to show the elevational treatments. So you get more of a kind of a framed frontage to the front building on um, the river. The reason for that is to try and give it a more elongated and sort of slender feel rather than having it uh, if you like, yeah, so that, that's the emphasis to rather than having it and distinguishing it from the middle blocks. Uh, similarly, on the other side, it's just showing the elevation front towards the Semex site on the bottom image. So, in terms of the jetty, uh, the PLA have looked at the feasibility of this. Uh, they are the statutory consultee, they've engaged in the design of the wharf and the jetty from a very early stage. Uh, they've reviewed the provisional navigational risk assessments and are satisfied that these are sufficient. Uh, a full navigational risk assessment uh, would be subject to a planning condition which is attached to the agenda. Um, and that will include details of passage uh, passage plan, operational plan to show full assessment uh, on the navigational safety, which is one of the concerns that was raised by uh, CEMEX. This is just trying to show a bit of context to where the site is located so you get uh, a feel for what's happening around. So it's in a PTEL 3-4, which is good public transport accessibility. The site's highlighted in red. These rings around, if you can't see them, it's, the inner ring is a five-minute walk. The outer ring is a 10-minute walk. The closest uh, railway station is actually in Wandsworth Town uh, across the bridge. 
Uh, and then the nearest beyond that is Imperial Wharf. And then you've got some other stations just slightly further afield. Uh, and significantly, you've got some buses in the right-hand image, which are quite close to the site. So quite well served by buses. Uh, this image is just trying to show you, uh, the relationship with the ground floor servicing arrangements. So you've got residential access uh, at the rear on Town Mead Road. Uh, and then you've got um, disabled parking bays, which will be electric bays. And you've got some loading bays. Uh, and there's a servicing delivery plan, which is secured as part of the uh, application conditions. So in terms of residential amenity, um, the buildings are set back at least 18 meters away from the nearest opposing residential. So there's no loss um, in terms of outlook. The proposed buildings on Tower Mead Road, which is where the most residential properties are um, because of the setback of 18 meters at least, often between 18 and a half and 22. There's no impact in, well, we don't consider based on on-site judgment, given these distances and the sort of height that's proposed on that elevation, five stories comparable some of the properties opposite which range between two and seven stories so we consider that to be acceptable in this location which is an urban location in the south Fulham riverside where high density development is encouraged uh, on balance i'll go through it in a bit more detail the um, daylight and sunlight impacts are considered acceptable uh, as far as the agent of change principle that's if you didn't know just for clarification that's where if you're citing developments next door to a noise generating development you need to consider the future occupiers of the proposed elements and whether or not um, the environment is suitable for them so that they don't then complain about being cited next to a noise generating development so there's been an assessment of that the applicants have submitted as part of the uh, policies required under london plans uh, an agent of change principle report which has been considered by our noise assessment team uh, there are also several conditions which are attached which uh, mitigate noise impacts etc and other sort of um, concerns on agent of change principle in terms of residential amenities, I want to come back to daylight and sunlight and just sort of give an overview. Uh, it's in short, sunlight is acceptable in this location uh, in terms of impact on the most affected properties. Uh, most affected properties are Dwyer House, which is on the corner, seven story flats. Uh, the buildings four to 10 uh, Town Mead Road, which are houses, they said terrace houses, two to three story. Uh, and then Spackman House, which is sort of directly opposite, uh, which is a five-storey flatted development. Um, and you can see on this image, the site is highlighted in red. And then beyond that, you've got the Fulham Wharf site, which is highlighted in blue as well. And then the Semex site sandwiched between. So none of the buildings which are further away at Fulham Wharf or the building on the corner at um, 360 uh, Wandsworth Bridge Road, which is a pub with a residential above, a uh, sufficient distance away, and Carnworth House. So no harm. So the emphasis is really looking at the three build, three locations, Dwyer House, uh, the properties in Tower Mead Road, and then Spackman House. So in respect of Dwyer House, um, uh, we've employed a daylight and sunlight consultant for all of the daylight assessments. And I think you met him the last committee with um Ian Diaz, who came along uh, and, and gave a presentation on the Shepherd's Bush um, uh, development. Uh, and he did a similar sort of exercise with this, where he's carried out uh, an assessment of the applicant's submissions. Uh, and looking at Dwyer House, which is, if we go back to this image, it's the one that's probably furthest away on the corner. Here it is. You've got some balconies and you've got uh, obviously some you know, brickwork separating some of those balconies and some windows, but effectively, it's only one window at ground floor, which is significantly affected, if you like, um, in terms of what we call a major infringement, because um, if you categorize the infringements as either minor, moderate or major, uh, there's only one window that actually results in a, what we describe as a major infringement. And on that point, I would say that even if you had a scheme which was compliant, BRE compliant, and sort of two, three stories, it would still have... Uh, an impact because it's the windows that's affected underneath the balcony uh, and that creates a particular unique situation. Then you come to the properties directly opposite, which are four to six, eight and 10 Talmud Road. Again, just going back to that image, they're situated here, four to six, eight, 10. And you can see these are two story and three story and these are all um, terrace houses. Uh, and ironically, none of these, are in, there are no major impacts on any of these. There are moderate impacts and minor impacts but none of them are major in terms of uh, vertical skylight or daylight distribution uh, most of the living rooms or all of the living rooms are to the rear 
the bedrooms are to the front. Um, so again, because the bedrooms are rather than living spaces, that's quite important point to make. Uh, and then we come to uh, Spackman House, which is a five-storey flat, which is probably the most affected um, in terms of impact uh, from the proposed development. And that's largely in part because it's quite a sensitive location simply because of the way the building has been designed. So when you look at this image on top, and just to show you again where that is, that's Spackman House in the middle. Uh, when you look at this image, you can see you've got some balconies uh, and they've got soffits underneath. And then you've got this sort of projecting, if you like, balcony at first floor which reduces the amount of light to these properties at the base. It's similar effect as you move up the building, it reduces the amount of light uh, to the spaces below. But significantly, you've got either side of those balconies in this sort of central location, you've got these um, staircase areas, which have walls, and they effectively could be described as winged walls. So if you put the winged walls together with the balconies, it results in a darkening, which is inherent in the design of the building. So when you take that into account, uh, and you look at so the impact in terms of uh, daylight on these property, uh, you see that there's some major adverse impacts at ground floor. Uh, and to be fair, that um, impact, even if you had a BRE compliant building would still be major. Um, so it's when you get to first floor and above, you know, that's when you start thinking, okay, is it going to be significant? Uh, and as you get to first floor and second floor, it's more moderate impact. Uh, and then, you know, the BRE does allow some flexibility in terms of what they call a theoretical review, but it's like, almost like a paper exercise, basically saying if you took away the winged walls and you took away the balconies, what would you be left with? You'd be left with a compliant building. So the point here is that you've got something which is you know, difficult to comply with because they designed the building, these winged walls and balconies. So, okay. Um, then, Alan, you might want to just jump in here. You've got some views of the buildings uh, from surrounding areas. Thanks, Robin. So just to just carry on. So in terms of the townscape assessment submitted um, with the application, this includes a number of views. We've just got a selection of these here to show the kind of most extreme elements of, of impact. So this is um, the view from South Park, where, again, this is one of the only key spaces where you'll see a significant amount of the, the development and um, post-completion of the scheme. You can see the wireframe in blue that shows the cumulative scale of what's proposed. Um, and again, that this would be screened, particularly during the spring, summer time, and um, obviously when the trees are in leaf um, from these views within this public open space. There's a similar impact to other spaces um, around the, the local area where you will see maybe the crown of the building um, in some of these spaces, but again, tree cover or additional buildings um, to mitigate any townscape concerns. Can we go on to the next one, Roy? So this is a localised view from Commerce Road um, that shows the, the proposed scheme in isolation on the left-hand image, again, as a wireframe. And on the right-hand side, you can see the, the black line um, that kind of sits in front of this image. That is the, the consensus Hellingham Road, sorry, Hellingham Retail Park scheme, um, which actually kind of serves to screen a significant portion of the, the development from this perspective. Can we go on to the next one? And then again, this is a river view from um, Putney Rail Bridge, uh, pedestrian access. And again, this shows the cumulative scale. The, the, the wireframe in blue is the, the presented scheme of the proposal and the other consents are in black for the cumulative schemes that could come forward. But again, showing that the impact is diminished overall. And again, this is just the, the localized view from the river um, on the south um, side of the river looking Northwest, sorry, northeast, sorry, um, and this this includes the delivered um, form wharf development on the right hand side of the image, um, the, the the proposed scheme, and then the Hellingham Road, sorry, Hellingham Retail Park scheme in the foreground of the images, the the wireframe um, on the left hand side of the image. So again, showing how the scale of the proposals relate to those other consented schemes. So back to me. Thank you, Alan. So um, the scheme itself has been subject to four rounds of uh, consultation following substantive amendments. I think I mentioned these earlier. Um, the first three rounds were subject to uh, site and press notices as well as 1,700 letters being circulated to neighbouring properties. The fourth round, which is the most recent round in January, was subject to 17, uh, sorry, 1,700 uh, letters 
with no site notification. So in response, the first round, we had 60 objection letters, seven letters of support, six neutral. Second round, uh, there were eight objections. The third round, um, 29 objections, one support and two neutral. Uh, the fourth round, 29. I should make clear that um, each round was open to the same set of people. So some people made more than one set of objections, sometimes repeating, sometimes just uh, elaborating, but essentially the main issues that are raised are those summarised below. Uh, is there a housing need for these particular properties? These properties could remain empty, not for families, and question whether they are affordable, affordability. Questions uh, the height and scale, concerns about parking, traffic generation, road safety, particularly impact on Monsworth Bridge Road Junction, uh, and public transport accessibility. I think I mentioned it's in a PTAL 3.4, which is quite good. There are some proposed uh, improvements to the Wandsworth Bridge Junction, which currently is a dangerous crossing, if you like, because it doesn't have any um, green man crossing, et cetera, or nothing at the moment. This proposal secures improvements to that junction through the Section 106, where the developer would pay for improvements at the junction, including winding of pavements. Uh, also, concerns that were raised were about pollution, loss of light, overshadowing, construction nuisance, proximity to cement work sites, uh, and public access to the Thames Path. Uh, we had some specific objections from Greg Hans, the MP, Fulham Society, uh, adjacent site at Semex and Porcinosia. All those are referred to in the report. Uh, in terms of statutory responses, the GLA have considered the proposals and um, submitted a stage one report. Uh, raising no objections. Uh, Similarly, the Environment Agency considered the report in terms of impact on biodiversity in the river, raised no objections, subject to conditions. The PLA, the Port of London Authority, or the Navigation Authority for the river, raised no objections, subject to conditions. And the Health and Safety Executive, who were consulted in relation to fire safety because the need to introduce a secondary stair and have satisfactory fire access following the Grenfell uh, um, we have at Grenfell and the changes to the building control legislation, all that is compliant. Whereas originally when it was submitted, it wasn't compliant uh, because the regulations changed partway through submission. So those matters have been addressed satisfactorily. Uh, so just overall, uh, in principle, we think this is uh, something that could be supported, should be supported because it's a safeguarded wharf that would be retained. Housing is provided on site, 276 units, and that's in line with our a local plan which seeks to provide uh, housing, uh, more housing in the borough and also in this part of the borough in South Fulham Riverside where um, there's targeted growth for housing. Uh, the site also would involve 35% uh, affordable housing uh, and um, provides good quality accommodation. Uh, we consider it to be appropriate massing. Uh, there's no adverse impact on conservation area um, or heritage and uh, in terms of residential amenity, we think uh, that it's an acceptable agent of change impact out on daylight and sunlight, privacy, noise, uh, transport I've touched on. Again, we've got no objections in that respect, subject to various conditions being uh, attached. Uh, and there is a CO2 payment in lieu uh, secured through the section 106 to where there's a shortfall. Uh, and this is a list of all the sort of heads and turns. I won't run through all these, but the key ones being the affordable housing, the carbon offset payments, uh, employment skills, uh, and various highway um, improvements at uh, Wandsworth Bridge Road Junction, the Thames footpath extension, uh, and then wheelchair accessible units 10%. So our recommendation is that the proposals be approved. Thank you very much. Okay, Roy, thank you very much. Um, now I'd like to invite two speakers. We have Hattie charlie Paul, who's the applicant, and Chris Beard, who's the agent. And uh, whenever you're ready, you have five minutes between you if you'd like to come to the uh, to the microphone. And um, whenever you're ready, if you just press the button and the, the microphone will go green. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Hattie Charlie Paul. I'm the development manager from Henley, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. This site is one of the last undeveloped sites on this stretch of river, and we've worked really closely with planning officers over the last four years to develop this scheme. We've taken this scheme with our team through a series of changes and amendments that responds to comments and the views of stakeholders. 
It's a truly mixed use scheme. The residential element offers 35% affordable housing and that equates to 81 brand new affordable units in the borough. It includes an extension to the Thames path with a publicly accessible pocket park that allows visitors to this site to enjoy it in a way they haven't been able to previously. As well as the on-site benefits deliver about 14 million pounds of sill into the borough and improvements to the junction and the pedestrian crossings. Swedish Wharf is a safeguarded wharf, as you've heard, although neither Albert nor Swedish have been used for this purpose for a number of years. We've worked collaboratively with the Port of London Authority over the last four years to ensure that the wharf facility that underpins this scheme secures the long-term viability of the protected use, and the PLA will further secure the future of the wharf by taking a long-term interest in it once complete. Some time ago and under a previous ownership, this site was the subject of a scheme that also married residential and wharf use, but despite being consented with zero affordable housing delivered, it failed to come forward. Since we submitted this application, we've been working through detailed design and we've taken the scheme out to tender to contractors with a view to starting on site within the next 12 months. And I hope you can see our belief in this scheme and our commitment to seeing it delivered. I'm gonna hand over to Chris from DP9, as our planning advisor. Thank you, I didn't want to take up too much more of your time. So um, we'd welcome if there are any questions that you wish to address to us, we can help you with those uh, wherever we can. I think uh, as Hattie's explained, we've worked really collaboratively and I'd like to thank you uh, for the support from officers and the extremely detailed report that you have before you. Um, I can assure you Mr. Jones and Mr. Asagra Power have pushed us hard in making changes to the scheme in order to, for them to be able to support it with you this evening. In particular, we made changes um, in reducing the scale and heights of the buildings uh, so that the relationship to the neighbours as well as the townscape was appropriate uh, with some very detailed work on daylight and sunlight um, for the neighbours immediately to the north. Um, the entrances from a traffic point of view are, are very similar to the existing site on Townmead Road. The circuit that works is from entering on the eastern side closest to Comley's exiting further west and then turning left so turning west back towards once bridge road which obviously makes for the easiest maneuver um and, and i think we're confident that that works and i think your your highways advice has the same um so we'd like your support for the scheme please um please do ask us any questions if if that's appropriate okay thank you very much thank you both if you'd like to return to your seats thank you so much thank you Okay, now that brings us to committee members' questions to officers, and who would like to start with the questions? Yeah, Councillor Chavot, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for, for this presentation, which is very detailed. And in the report, um, we can see there's great due diligence towards future residents when it comes to noise. So I wanted to piece things together with the addendum that you've circulated around the fact there'll be a noise impact plan that will be drawn, as well as provisions to ensure that there'll be... Um, minimum sound level um, that is acceptable between um, residents and CEMEX and the port. How is that going to work technically? Um, who is going to set that sound limit? And what does it mean for residents moving in? And I also know that there's a heliport next to this scheme. Um, are you going to use construction material to absorb the sounds? Or how is that going to work? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um... In short, I mean, yes, uh, the application has been subject to what's called an agent of change principle uh, assessment, which requires that um, the applicant set out what mitigation measures will be carried out to uh, reduce the harm to future occupiers. And that's been set out in quite some detail. Uh, that's been assessed by our noise protection team. Uh, and uh, also it's been assessed by the um, uh, the GLA have looked at that uh, because of the nature of the wharf. Uh, so the wharf is such that it's been designed in such a way at an early stage, uh, in, I should say, uh, with the PLA to ensure that it's like a contained box. Um, so it's, it's like a concrete contained box, which is effectively insulated the noise within, and it's got uh, mechanical ventilation, obviously, let, uh, the occupants uh, inside breathe. Um, then in terms of impacts uh, on from the CEMEX, which is an established use, has been there for a very long time. It doesn't look like it's going, going anywhere. So 
uh, from from our perspective, the applicant is required then to assess the impact of that on future occupiers as well. And they've done that as part of the agent of change principle. Uh, we've attached, you know, various conditions as an operational plan. There are some noise conditions. There's also a um, uh, yeah, sound insulation. There's all sorts of conditions basically to mitigate against harm uh, for the future occupiers when the neighbouring use, which is established as an open yard, effectively generates noise, whereas the, their box is, is contained. And so there's a condition, for example, that will be introduced, condition 30 now, which is quite specific. Uh, it talks about a noise assessment being submitted to the council, uh, in, you know, including details of sand insulation for the envelope of the building, uh, and also a noise assessment uh, being provided to us to show that um, they have complied with the measures outlined in their report, which was submitted to us, which has been considered by our colleagues in the um, noise pollution team. Uh, in particular, there were some concerns that were raised by the SEMEX, who are the adjoiners, adjoining occupiers next door, about windows being sealed shut. And if they're allowed to remain open, how's that going to work? If you're an occupier of that building, you're then going to end up complaining because you live next door to a site. But um, some of those windows will be shut also because the building will be mechanically ventilated. Um, during times of noise, you know, they can shut the windows that so will reduce the amount of noise and they can have satisfactory, you know, cooling, air conditioning and heating. Uh, and in addition to that, there's some noise level set out in the second part of the conditions that say it shouldn't be more than uh, 50 dB uh, within the department. So, sorry, within the apartment excuse me, within the apartments. And again, that's all trying to make sure that it's an acceptable level. And that 50 dB level, I think, as we sort of might have talked about this, um, is basically equivalent to um, some noise in, uh, I think I had it written down somewhere, um, noise in a library. So it's not loud at all. Um, so it's quite high specification levels to try and make sure that the future occupiers don't end up complaining about the development which they've moved next door to because it's unneighbourly. So that's what the applicants have had to do and that's what um, uh, has been assessed as part of this application. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. And specifically on the question of the heliport, um, what do you have? And also um, adding to that, so in the report, we see that there's a representation, I think, I can't remember which statu statutory um, um, consultee it is, but that asks why buildings aren't more spaced out and the answer is that there's noise around and that helps mitigate that but then there's provision of public space inside that sort of if you will um block of, of of buildings and so is there a risk actually that the noise reverberates and is kept inside and actually um whether the public area or the residence only area generates a lot of noise for residents that isn't part of that noise um Plan where you've said to us that if I understand it correctly, there would be a mechanism whereby um, a certain level of noise from Semex and mm. the port is taken. I mean, this is probably a helpful image. You can see the, if you like, the amenity areas in the centre surrounded by blocks in a kind of a U shaped fashion. Uh, that lower courtyard, which is on the right hand side, uh, the height of the buildings surrounding it is. It's, it's such that um, that would help to mitigate against noise uh, from CEMEX. Uh, and you mentioned um, the helicopters, for example. I mean, it's it's a path for the, you know, a route, you know, helicopter pad in, on the other side of the bridge at, in Wandsworth. But that's, you know, it's something that's been there established. Again, it's not something that we would necessarily raise concerns about. But again, because of the nature of the design of this building being sort of high walled, if you like, and secure the space within an acoustic glazing, sound insulation, et cetera, that is not something that would be um, harmful, I think, to future occupiers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? Yeah, Councillor Harcourt. Thank you, Chair. Just beginning uh, to follow on from, from this particular issue, because I think it is going to be one of the major issues here. Um, for instance, um, I, I, I have the pleasure of sitting on the Western Riverside Waste Authority, which has uh, a prote um, protected wharf on the other side of the river down at Smuggler's Way. And uh, next door to that, obviously, is the Battersea Power Station development with very uh, expensive properties. And the same issues came up there. And there's, now there's all sorts of complaints about noise and smell and goodness knows what. Um, so what is there 
that we are doing in this in terms of conditions or legal agreements or whatever that will stop residents complaining because they're obviously going to be moving in. They know there's going to be noise possibly from helicopters, possibly from the Semex one next door and such like, and from the protected wharf underneath that would, you know, a, a Swedish wharf, which is being reactivated, which is, is a positive thing in my opinion, but nonetheless, there's all of that. What is there that will stop people complaining about this or get, removing their ability? And is, is it indeed right to, uh, that ability to complain is removed? Well, there's a condition uh, 85, which uh, is on page uh, 40 of the uh, report. It talks about agent of change principle. It talks about uh, an operational management plan. Uh, and basically it sets out their guidance on um, what should standards should be met in terms of potential noise and nuisance from an, in, an environmental health point of view. But there are some particular references in there which are quite pertinent to what you've, you've just raised, um, which is that um, how you know what, what's expected and um under i think uh paragraph b it talks about a commitment to provide an information pack to all residents of the development which shall include an explanation of the mitigation provided and how it works the maintenance responsibilities in respect to the mitigation provided confirmation that the filtration system for the mechanical ventilation and heat recovery systems will be maintained as part of servicing uh responsibilities for each of the flat owners uh, and then it talks about uh, situations where that you know heat recovery systems fail, and again it goes on to paragraph five: residents being responsible to make use of mitigation provided to protect themselves from exposure. So, for example, I think I mentioned before that uh, some of the windows will be openable on the eastern flank, uh, but when it's closed and it's up to obviously the occupants, if the windows are closed, there'll be satisfactory mitigation in terms of noise levels. Um, that's just one example, uh, and then it talks specifically about complaints in uh, bullet point six where it says complaints procedure being the procedure com residents should follow if there are any complaints about noise nuisances on noise environmental health impacts uh, alleged uh, to arise from neighboring areas in this instance it's expected that the owner of the development the management company will be contacted and clearly identified liaison officer to try and manage that process so uh, it's designed specifically to try and make sure that the, the occupiers knowing that they are in a development which is adjacent to a noise generating use um, there are mitigation measures in place and so long as they exercise those and those are being applied correctly it's a satisfactory environment and there's you know satisfactory impact on semex satisfactory impact on future occupiers it doesn't stop them complaining but... <laughs> <laughs> thanks Roy. I, I think legal just wants to come in on that um just, just to kind of um, explain, some councils have, have trialled what's called um, a deed of noise easement, where the, the developer enters into an agreement uh, with the adjoining uh, property, um, in this uh, instance, the adjoining wharf owners, whereby um, the adjoining wharf, for example, CMEX, would be allowed to continue to make noise at a predetermined level, which prevents future residents from um, complaining. So it, it's, a, it's a deed of easement. It's been trialled by uh, Tower Hamlets, Elephant and Castle, uh, and I think even in Milton Keynes. So that is something that the council could explore as part of a planning, a legal agreement, whereby they require the landowner to enter into a, 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 a noise easement with the adjoining landowners, whereby they will ensure that the residents don't make a noise complaint. Okay, thank you. Um, can I move on to? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you may remember that uh, 15, 20 years ago, we did an expansion of the Semex. Uh, and I can't remember if it was a deed of easement or not, but I think it was the Vandenberg Margarine Factory that they produced um, an agreement, whether it was an easement or not, uh, that prevented residents of the new, new flats being granted permission from complaining. This doesn't seem to be the case in, in this instance at the moment. Uh, and I am concerned that the Semex plant, which is a long-standing uh, business uh, in, in the borough may be forced 
to close. Um, uh, and I am again concerned on the other side that is it just to potential new residents that are going to be uh, uh, moving in, if the mitigation measures that are uh, put in place are not sufficient to prevent them from being disturbed. And I, I believe we even, the Semic factory, I think, starts at about 5 a.m. in the morning, from memory, but uh, the officers may be able to correct me on that, but, uh, and goes on quite late at night because the ships are coming in and out. And I do have serious concerns uh, about new residents and their quality of life, as, along with, balanced on the other side, um, the future of the business on, on Tammy Road. Sorry, thank, thank you very much for letting me interrupt. No, that, that that's fine. Um, I suppose uh, in many ways it's similar to anybody moving in to live next to Craven Cottage or next to QPR. You know, both of those have been on site for a good many years, Fulham in particular since, you know, the previous century, well, century before that, in fact. Uh, we've had that same discussion in relation to Fulham Football Ground and, uh, you know, when they were looking to expand it and people moving in and the noise and all the rest of it. So it's, it's the same sort of principle. So, you know, uh, I, I, I'm... Concerned about the residents, obviously, and I'm aware of the possibility of those of the noise. But uh, I think uh, you know there's plenty being said in terms of mitigation and such like for, for what I've heard. But anyway, uh, moving on. Um, firstly, can I uh, iterate uh, your comments about the, the this report? Very clear, very detailed. Uh, there's an awful lot of information in there. Uh, which I think is really, really good. The diagrams and so on make it much easier to be able to follow than some of the other reports that we've had uh, previously. Um, my first question, though, is about um, consultation. When I was reading this through, there's the, the consultation about the pre-app when there's uh, something like, what is it, 60% uh, and 73% supported something being done on this site. And then when it comes to the actual application the, the, there's loads of the, quite a few objections coming through what was was it the same sort of questions or were residents presented with the same consultation or was one just a, a general uh, do you want to see the site developed yes good idea when do we actually see it there's this a few issues with it could you just clarify uh to my knowledge uh you know we were at pre-app stage engaged with the applicants in discussions and they shared with us some images uh, and those are the same images that we've been advised that they share with residents we didn't attend those meetings but that's the same information obviously what was shown at pre-app stage was a larger iteration of what you see before you tonight um, but certainly there's been lots of consultation and engagement so I think um, during the first part of the consultation that they had, um, we were still in lockdown restrictions. So obviously a bit more difficult to get out and about, but certainly the last um, consultation that was carried out by the applicants at um, the app stage uh, was. Um... Sorry, Chair, just to, just to add to that, just to clarify the point, the pre-application advice obviously is non-statutory. The process is carried out by the responsibility of the developer. So... I wouldn't say we're taking a pinch of salt. They're encouraged to, to, to engage with local residents so they get involved in the planning process as early as possible. But obviously, from our perspective as a local planning authority, the key issue for us is the response to the statutory consultation once the planning application comes in, when matters are clearer. So it's it's not unusual to have people, you know, if you ask the question, do you want something done with the site? They'll say yes. There's, there's, there's generally not enough information they'd take of you in the round that becomes more obvious further down the line when the application is made. So it, it's not unusual, as I say, to see a sort of slight discrepancy between what they may have said early doors in the first contact to what they're saying now in, in response to a statutory consultation process that we're advised to carry out. Yes, that, thanks, that, that clarifies that. Um, I've got a number of other questions. Um, Transport and um, such like. Um, obviously, uh, this area is one we've had plenty of input on various issues, the clean air neighbourhood and all that, all of that, which I'm not going to go into here. But I'm aware that uh, and the next application is it the next application or the application after next that comes up. It relates to the new site, the gas holder site. 
and the construction work that's still going on down there and the traffic that that's generating there's other um developments in the area what what is the likely impact of all this traffic especially if you end up with the perfect storm with it all coming together and coming down town mead road to that horrible junction which is highly unsafe which i'll come on to in a minute I think we've got our transport colleague here to be able to answer some of these questions. Yeah, um, in relation to the construction impacts, what we've done is secured um, a condi planning condition and planning obligations in relation to um, use of the river. Um, and, and so they'll have to demonstrate that they will, um, the, the, the contractor or, or the developer will have to demonstrate that use of the river is part of um, the build out. And, and in terms of the impact on the surrounding highway network, for example, um, a barge can take between 50 and 60 vehicles off the the surrounding highway network so it, it can significantly reduce the not only the impact um on traffic but obviously on, on air pollution as well thanks for that um it's, it's not all negative that i'm asking about i hasten to add i think there's an incredible amount of positive stuff in here that um 73 is it 73 78 percent uh Carbon emissions reduction, superb. Uh, the um, uh, then you've got uh, the increase in uh, the green area down there. So you know, obviously, it's a, a a brownfield site, virtually all concrete, hard standing. As you said, suddenly we're now getting uh, was it uh, um, the greening factor of uh, 0.46, which is quite high, really. So that that's quite uh, good. So that's positive as well. Uh, bringing the wharf back into use, I think, is a positive thing, and I like the way it's been done uh, over there as well. So that all works very well indeed. Um, and uh, the use of the pho photovoltaic and such like over there, and uh, you added in also about uh, being uh, connectability in the future to some sort of heat network, which is something you know that we're looking at uh, various heat networks uh, across the borough. I know they're for the future, but nonetheless, the ability to connect into that I think is quite important. And for the first first time, or one of the few times I've ever seen whole life carbon being discussed in one of these reports as well. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm finding a lot of positives in this. Okay, thank you. I'll go to Councillor Walsh and then Councillor Seuss, please. Uh, thank you. Um, just want to return to the matter of the, the neighbouring site with uh, CMIX um, and the point made by legal about a an easement agreement. Uh, in terms of the, the calculation of the levels of noise and, you know, at what point it would start to be clarified as a, a nuisance versus... Um, what would be considered acceptable, obviously, assuming that this would be above which would ordinarily in other parts of the borough be considered already above that acceptable level. Um, as my concern on behalf of the so the business side for CMIX would be that um, concrete is, of course, a noisy production anyway, but equally, it is an industry that's going through a lot of change at the moment. Uh, Concrete is a highly carbon output. Um, I think, depending on what you read, somewhere between four and eight percent of global CO two emissions. So, a number of businesses, and I can only assume CMIX is included in that, are having to look at other means of production of concrete, which is, of course, highly experimental, both in terms of the technology used but also as a knock-on effect, the requirements to either retrofit or install new technologies, use new materials. So the level of noise that may be produced and sort of agreed upon at the beginning may change depending on whether the company is going through retrofitting, whether it's going through new production methods as well. So as my, my question to you is, how could a easement agreement be created that takes into account the need for all of these possible other changes 
at the same time as ensuring that we don't get to a completely unacceptable level for the potential new residents as well. Um, my understanding is that it will the starting point will be that it is set at a predetermined level, and that will be down to negotiations and the experts looking at it. Um, as to your question as to how do we then address any any increase in noise levels, um, again, we need to we can look at the other agreements that have been completed and how they've allowed for an increase in noise level. I would have thought a, a small percentage might be considered acceptable, um, but obviously not above a certain percentage. So we need to look at other uh, agreements where this has been dealt with, and it has been done before. But the starting point would be the predetermined noise level, the existing noise level. And, and just to comment, so is a deed of easement a planning instrument? <laughs> No, it's no. A, it's a separate. It's 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 a actually a private law um, agreement. However, there are councils who have secured it as part of a condition or a planning agreement. So, so the way I see this kind of working would be perhaps in the one hundred six agreement, um, having a, including an obligation whereby a deed of easement is entered into by a certain trigger. And this was the follow on to that is the determination of that preset level um assuming obviously that both parties can agree fabulous if both parties cannot agree who is the deferred authority to set that level it is a very it is a relatively new area we have very few noise easements um that have been entered into um, so I, I would have thought it is a risk assessment because if one is not completed, then there is a risk of challenge by, for example, in this instance, CMAX. And then it's down to the court as to how the court would uh, view, view the position. There have been cases where there has not been a deed of easement. I think it was where there was a development next, next to a race course or people residing next to a race course had objected and the courts took the view that the race course was already there. So there was an existing noise level and they had come, you know, they had bought this property next to this race course. So they had to um, be, be reasonable. So ultimately it'd be decided by the court. So with regard to, for example, in this instance, um, you know, if a deed, a, a deed of easement was not entered into, uh, then the risk would lie with the developer facing a challenge. Um, the, the the cases where a deed of easement was used was, um, I think there was one where the Ministry of Sound or development going uh, going up next to the Ministry of Sound and they resolved this noise issue by both parties entering into a deed of easement. Um, and there was another case where this is, I think, the Georgetown pub in Tar Hamlets where that was a music venue and the developers entered into a, a deed of easement with the um, the adjoining a music venue. Thank you. That's a very detailed explanation. I appreciate the examples that you've given. Um, if we do secure this as a part of a 106 agreement and it were to be challenged in the court, is there any risk to the council becoming in any way liable for the uh, the costs associated with that challenge as it was us who would have insisted on it uh, by virtue of the 106 agreement? Um, so if so, the, so it would be a, a, an agreement that is entered into voluntarily by, by the developer and, and CMAX, um, for example. Um, if there was a challenge, um, I suppose you'd envisage a member of the public challenging this um, and, and then the question is, on what basis? Um, if the challenge was that the council should not have imposed this obligation, then um, that would leave, leave us in a situation where um, the residents could bring a noise complaint. So, in effect, the council would have been acting reasonably. It is, it is adopting a pro procedure that has been used elsewhere. Um, one safeguard you could add in the uh, legal agreement um, is that if there was a challenge, the costs, the council's costs are met by the developer, because ultimately this is a, a private development benefiting the developer, and we are taking the necessary precautions that other councils have adopted.
would we need to secure that by condition or could this be left uh, It would to... have to be a legal agreement. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll leave that. My second question is just... Sorry, Councillor Walsh, yes. just before you move on, I just want to open this up to officers if officers have anything to say. I mean, to my mind, uh, what's in the addendum, the, the uh, replacement for condition 30 covers this adequately, but, but I wonder if officers want to give any opinion or, or comment on that. My colleague Miralini there has explained the options. I mean, it, uh, as she's pointed out, the legal agreement is a voluntary agreement. The developer is responsible for ensuring that appropriate mitigation measures are in place, given that they're moving in next to the existing uh, batching plants. So uh, my own view would be that it's probably more uh, reasonable to be included in a 106 agreement than to have it as a condition. Thank you very much. If you could just turn your mic off as well, please. Thanks. Yeah, Councillor Walsh. Thank you. Uh, my second question is just a quick one. I noticed the uh, the Hurlingham Retail Park that's mentioned, uh, the planning permission is granted in 2018. Now, I'm aware it does seem there is some element of sites works on the site. Do you regard this as work as a development that has already commenced? Because if not, obviously 2018, this would be classified as expired permissions. Yeah, the um, the distinction with Hurlingham Retail Park is it was approved back in about 2013, I think, around that time initially, and they implemented that. And then they came in with the deed of variation, which is the one you're referring to, which is effectively the form it's taken now, which is being built. They were different people. It was um, the, the people who got the initial consent sat on it for a long time. The current owners of the site are the ones who are developing it so they sort of brought it forward but it had been if you like the clock had been stopped on it at the time it was implemented the first permission was implemented and then there was a second because of that time stop of, with them implementing it they were able to put the 73 in as well because it was still open so it's a slightly different scenario to here this is obviously a standalone one um, and in that particular case because of that it predated sort of sill for example just give an obvious example of it so you know, what we'd have been looking for now, should we say that came forward as a development proposal is markedly different to what the administration at the time, which is a different administration, uh, their approach to it at that, at that point in time. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, my first question is on um, accessibility. There is mention of 10% of the uh, units being accessible to wheelchair users. And I was wondering if that, applies or how it applies to the affordable units uh, in the scheme if they have the same 10% um, offer of accessible units? I think it just applies across the scheme. So the 10%, so it's not, you know, 10% of the um, affordable units, it's, it's, it's across the scheme. I, I guess that begs a follow-up question. How much of the affordable units will be wheelchair accessible, if we know at this stage. I don't have that information to hand, but uh, we can say there's obviously the requirement to have 10% across the scheme and that's what's been achieved. But um, unless you want to ask the developer who's in the room, but I don't have that information to hand. So, so are you saying there's a risk that all the wheelchair accessible units could be not affordable? That's what I would, yeah, yeah that's what sorry I would as well. Uh, the, the wheelchair units are you know identified in block C, uh, and block C is the one that's on Townmead Road. So there are some wheelchair units in that block and they are identified on the proposals, on the plans. So, yeah, there will be some um, wheelchair units that are affordable in the development. Okay, uh, so thank you. Thank you for clarifying this. Um, we've touched on this in, in previous meetings uh, and there is mention in... Um, uh, one of the paragraphs, which I can't find at the moment, but um, it's about the review mechanisms uh, at future stages to ensure that uh, the viability of the scheme is as it was when approved and that the, the, affordable, the number of affordable units is maximized. Can you just explain this to us and whether you know there is any mechanism to ensure there can be more affordable units? Uh, it's, 
Section 106 would be secure review mechanism. Um, obviously, the applicant, uh, as part of the um, assessment process, has submitted a viability assessment that's been looked at by an independent um, consultant on behalf of the council. Uh, obviously, that's kind of like a, a snap you know, point in time. Uh, the development is due to take place over 31 months. So, you know, since the application was submitted, there's been some changes in the economy in terms of interest rates, et cetera, and viability may well have been affected in a slightly different way. But from the council's perspective, you know, um, we've got the review mechanism in place so that if at a later stage uh, it's deemed that circumstances have changed and more units can be integrated, then that's what we'll be seeking through the review mechanism. Okay, thank you. And, and finally, just a comment similar to uh, Councillor Harcourt's in that I found that there was really good detail on the affordability, affordability aspect of the scheme, uh, especially on the breakdown of the uh, different units and, and how they, 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 they compare with uh, what's on offer. And yeah, I think that's very good practice and uh, compares favorable to other reports we've seen. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Carmel, go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. I do have a, a number of things, but uh, I'll uh, just stick to begin with, uh, with a question on noise. The, and you, the report is saying how they have uh, assessed the noise from uh, the Semex plant. Uh, but as if I recall correctly, there is an extant planning application um, well, I know there is, because I just looked it up to remind myself. 2021-04047, which is erection of new aggregate storage facilities to replace existing, including internal storage bins and enclosed stairways with installation of new transfer conveyors and a new above-ground hopper uh, receiving barge delivered aggregates directly. Was the noise assessment done uh, taking into account the new noise, uh, the new hopper, and the new conveyor belts, or uh, will that add to uh, the noise as and when this uh, application is decided? And quite why it's still outstanding uh, from 2021 uh, is another matter altogether. Um, just to refer back very quickly to uh, the Ptarmigan scheme, which was the, the the previous one, I am uh, very pleased to see that uh, uh, the affordable housing share has uh, gone up um, from zero to uh, uh, to thirty five. Oh, I might as well put it just lumps with young, so I won't go into great detail. I do have a problem with the design of the building. Um, I do not think it is consistent with the uh, surrounding architecture. I think it's over-dominant and I think it will impact on the view because the tallest building right on the river, it will impact on, on the river view uh, and on, on the bridge. And I know we've got loads and loads of conditions, but uh, I am very worried about uh, contamination uh, because oil storage facilities have historically um, caused serious contamination. And I'm sure Mr. Bellis will remember another site not a, not a thousand yards away on Townmead Road that had a significant uh, contamination problem. Um, and can I just have reassurance from officers that they are sure that uh, the potential contaminants, uh, because Tamid Road was traditionally uh, an industrial area, a uh, lot, lot of tanneries were down on Tamid Road, um, and that also because they used arsenic in the making of uh, uh, tanning leather, uh, is another potential contaminant down there. And I just want to have assurance from the officers uh, that uh, that they are satisfied that the conditions are robust enough. Thanks, Councillor. I'm sorry, just remind me. So one point is contamination. The, the, the second was design. And what was your first point? Your first question? The, the other application. Oh, okay. That was taken into, sorry. The other application and whether the noise that will be generated 
uh, from the 2021 application by Semex, uh, which is still a waiting decision, um, uh, will, was taken into account when they did the noise assessment for potential uh, uh, noise intervention on the proposed new uh, I'll come back to the noise one last, but um, uh, in terms of uh, contamination, uh, I can say that obviously there is some oil storage on the site at the moment, which uh, we are aware of. Uh, the application has been subject to uh, consultation with our colleagues in the contaminated land team. They've requested uh, that the six conditions be attached uh, to you know, ensure uh, public safety. So, yeah. That's a good. If, Alan, if you want to answer the second question, sorry. Yeah, sure. Can, can we just go back to the slide just to the, the river view? Sorry, Rory, if you could just turn your mic off while um, while Alan's speaking. Sorry, just the one that shows the view looking northeast. That's fine. That's great. Thank you. So just, I, I think, Council completely understand the, the consideration in terms of the scale of where, where a tall building should be in this instance, and noting the fact that the earlier scheme did suppress height adjacent to the, the bridge. That's completely understandable. I think as officers, we've gone through quite a lengthy journey in terms of the pre-app on this, um, and note that a number of different um, approaches are taken across the address to bridges throughout London and, you know, in terms of the, the tall buildings being there as a, a wayfinding device to the bridge itself in the local area. And that's, I think, part of the case that the developers made in their submissions and part of our discussion of this. So we, we have taken a balanced view towards that. There isn't a, you know, a precise argument either way. It's something that is subjective in terms of how people either want to find a wayfinding to a, a bridge or a landmark such as that in terms of pedestrian wayfinding, et cetera. We do think, you know, given the, the scale of the building, its approach in terms of the appearance and the, the limited local townscape impacts, that, you know, this is the an approach that can be supported. Um, and that, that's the view that we've taken in the reporting, really. So we'll step in on that. Um, if you look um, from the ones with bridge onto it, what will the difference be between the corner buildings on either side? Sorry, Council, with the, the, the Hellingham retail park site on the other side, yeah, I mean, there will be a pronounced difference in the heights. And I think, again, we've been quite mindful of that in terms of the, the scale of what comes forward in terms of, you know, trying to avoid a canyon of buildings of identical height having a, a potential impact in terms of being, you know, homogenous in terms of scale. There is a variation, as you can see in the image, between... The, the the existing and um, wharf development of ferries and undulating height across its frontage and again that happens on Hellingham retail but this site obviously brings something of more considerable scale particularly because of the, the retained wharf use below so again it is a balanced view in terms of what's been taken of the overall street scene that's created and the, the actual impact upon those river views particularly not just this one view but the wider enclave of views that we've considered Sorry, just come back to your um, third point, which you raised about noise. There is a condition attached, uh, condition 34, which talks, oops, sorry, there's several conditions, sorry. Uh, Just for clarification, there's a there's a. Are you talking about the impact from Semex based on the proposed? The, the, yeah, the yeah, outstanding yeah. application from I mean, 2021. Yeah, I mean, what I can say on that is that the the application, obviously, they considered the worst case scenario set out in the report uh, for all surrounding uh, 
industrial or noise generating activities and details will need to be submitted to us for approval in, as part of an, that assessment. So there's a condition attached, uh, which requires that they do that as part of the um, operation management plan. Just, just, just so I get this right, uh, just for clarification, condition 34 uh, applies no, that's not, to external yeah. noise from machinery on the application site. What I'm talking about is potential additional noise that will or may be generated, because we don't know, um, uh, from the outstanding application. And new hoppers and conveyor belts uh, tend to sound to me to be inherently noisy. Okay, I think at this point, I'm going to use my chair's discretion to invite uh, the speakers back up and if they can provide some clarification on this and, and perhaps answer the question, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to come in and speak. Um, I, I think there's there's two related points here. Um, Sorry, if you just give us one moment, sure. just for, for legal to clarify something. Could you turn your mic off as well, please? Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, I think there's two points here. I think the first point is about the level of noise within the proposed residential and the design of the new development and how it mitigates the impact of noise from the exterior. So we have to start from understanding that this is a completely bespoke design purpose built for its context. And its context is there is a cement batching uh, factory next door. There's a busy road on Wandsworth Bridge Road. There's obviously neighbouring residential already at Fulham Riverside and on Town Mead Road. So this relationship already exists. But the benefit of having a new building is we can do a number of things. So in terms of the materials, uh, in terms of the operation, um, <clears throat> and in terms of the position of the buildings, there are three factors that help you to mitigate the noise impact. The, the, the noise conditions that um, are set out in the addendum paper are specifically to demonstrate to you that in terms of ventilation and noise and mitigation and also frequency in terms of uh, vibration, all of the interior conditions are acceptable. So I think that's the first point around noise and vibration. I think the, the second point in relation to the, the current application on the CEMEX site, the, the simple answer is no, the noise assessment doesn't take account for that because the noise levels have been assessed for the current CEMEX operation, which includes the, the hoppers on the site at the moment. And it was right to say in the discussion earlier that the CEMEX operation is unlimited in the sense that because of the tidal flows, things arrive in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day. And, and when they do, noise is made. So the noise assessment undertaken to inform the design of the scheme and what we think will demonstrate to you that the conditions are acceptable for the future occupants is based on the current CEMEX operation. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Carmel, do you have any follow-up questions or or did officers want to add anything to that? Yeah, Roy, go ahead. Yeah, it's only just to say, obviously, the application which Councillor Carmel has referred to, that's still under consideration. I appreciate it's been around for some time, but it, it's still under consideration. So it wouldn't necessarily be prudent to take that into account because it's still under consideration. Um. It will be given the relevant weight when I come to uh, uh, make a decision because it hasn't yet been decided. So I, I am well aware uh, that uh, there is a level of weight that I can attach to the importance of what I consider on that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pascu, I will come to you, but I think Councillor Chavot Verde, just on this point, if you want to come in, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. But so to understand that if you're basing the noise assessment level and that sort of limit that will be agreed between that site and the neighbours um, to the existing sound levels and to the councillor's 
rightful concerns that hoppers and conveying be- belts might make more noise, then therefore, if it's above that sound limit, it would be open to complaints by residents and therefore potentially enforcement. So essentially, that's a guarantee that CEMEX will be incentivized to keep that noise coming from this new equipment to a level that is lower than the one that will be agreed. And in fact, um, that wouldn't be the case without this planning application. I can I can see some, I don't know. Do you, yeah, so that's yeah. Material to, yeah, that wouldn't be material to the consideration of this because you never know, they might withdraw the application. So we just need to take into consideration what's, what is happening at present. Okay, yeah, go ahead, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a number of quite disparate questions, if I may. Um, the first one um, is about the Thames path, just to clarify that we won't be seeing a continuous Thames path um, because you obviously have the, 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 the keys that you stop it. So you're not actually getting a huge amount more of Riverside walkway. Uh, it's not physically possible to go across the CEMEX site uh, simply because they've got cranes uh, and they need the airspace. So as it stands, they wouldn't be able to extend the mm. footpath beyond where it's proposed unless obviously in the future CEMEX themselves came forward with an application to do something on their site and propose something slightly different. Um, and by the same token, the um, going the other way, the bridge is there and there's, mm. you know, the only route is to go down the side of um, Onsus Bridge back onto um, uh, Townmead Road, Carmel's Road Junction, and cross the road, that, and that's a busy junction. So the reason why the mitigation is there uh, as a contribution to the improvements to the junction is to help that facilitate that for improved facilities for pedestrians and cyclists. So the Green Man has introduced help safety. So, so the idea is that someone wanting to use that sort of riverside walkway, you'd basically have to go up Onsworth Bridge Road use the junction, go down Townmead Road, and then go up somewhere by the Sainsbury's? Uh, no, they go up the side of Wandsworth Bridge Road adjacent to Hurlingham uh, Retail Park, which there's a footpath there, and then you get to the junction, cross over the road, and then go along the west side of the proposed building, and then there's a Entrance. So if you see in this image here, mm -hmm. uh, in the bottom left corner, you've got some stairs which go up to that raised podium. So you, you basically cross the road at the junction, come on to the other side of the road, then walk up there, those steps. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, turning to the um, image of um, South Park um, and the fact that there's trees in the way so you wouldn't be able to see very much the new building from South Park. Um, those trees, given that they're in the middle of the park, presumably if you're standing with the trees behind you looking towards the building, that would be a very different photograph. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Townscape Visual Impact Assessment submitted by the application does include a, a, what's known as a zone of theoretical visibility, which covers off a, a number of um, areas where the, the skin is visible from. So in that image, there is an understanding that this will be a development that is highly visible within majority of the aspects of the park. I think this is an image that's representative to show what we'll be seeing in a kind of key image around one of the key open spaces um, at the centre of the park. And then, you know, there will be a different varying degrees of intervisibility here. But again, you know, because of the tree cover and because of the the extent, sorry, the, the extent of additional buildings, particularly um, Barton House that sits in the, the foregrounds of the view at the moment, again, there isn't considered to be a harmful impact in terms of how you experience or use the park um, within within the conservation area. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask a quick question about um, Spackman House um, and the light impact on the ground floor flat? Um, just looking at the numbers there, they seem to be quite worrying because we're essentially looking at reduction of between 75% um, and 39.7%, which seems, you know, pretty, pretty significant reductions. And obviously, I'm, I wouldn't be arguing that 
this is a showstopper necessarily, but it would be good to know um, what can be done to help the unfortunate person living there. So, um, in short, uh, if you were to do a policy compliance scheme, which effectively rises two stories and beyond towards the river, it would still fall short. So it's simply the fact that this site has a luxury, as it were, at the moment of having a an open site directly opposite. Um, that's quite unusual in an urban setting. Uh, so to help the situation, previously there were seven stories, uh, and you know that reduction of two stories has been had a significant improvement in the situation. If they took another story off, it wouldn't make any perceptible difference because it would still cause harm to the ground floor. So then you'd have to take another floor. And then you'd, again, it's still that situation where it wouldn't make that much difference. So the problem is, is that it's just inherent in that design with those um, winged walls uh, and the balconies above that those rooms are going to be dark. Thank you very much. Um, final question, if I may. Um, and um, I, when, when discussing this with the Wandsworth Bridge Road Association, um, they mentioned, um, and, and I thought it was quite interesting to um, for them to raise the canyon effect. So basically, when you've got quite a lot of pollution, and that's a pretty polluted road, um, if you have two very sort of tall buildings either side of it, and you essentially create that tunnel effect, um, now obviously with Hurlingham Retail Park, um, and what is a very large mass with a lot of the greening being on the inside of the building rather than the outside. Um, have you, plus the associated um, sort of increases in traffic, uh, both in build and operate stage, um, what assessment has been made about air pollution um, as regarding that particular development and uh, what the impacts might be? I mean, in terms of design, the canyon effect, yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is the impact on air quality. Uh, I think that's what you're saying. Uh, from our perspective, our air quality officer has looked at this and uh, has attached various conditions to uh, mitigate. Uh, and um, I think uh, my colleague was whispering something, I didn't quite catch what she said, but um, it's about securing greening um, by condition or section 106, sorry. Um. Yeah, I was I was just saying that as part of the the obligations in set out in the report in relation to highways works, there is greening and tree planting and greening can mitigate the that that canyon effect that you you're referring to. And sorry, would that greening be on the Wandsworth Bridge Road itself? Um, it, it's going to be around the junction, I think. Um, and so, yes, it would be around the junction, it'd be on Talmud Road. Unfortunately, the actual bridge, it couldn't be on the bridge that is um, structure is owned by Wandsworth, but um, where it's possible, grit greening will be introduced to where it's within our public highway and we can achieve it. And it doesn't affect the integrity of the structure of the bridge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harcourt's been waiting for some time, then I'll come to you, Councillor Conwell. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just uh, a couple of uh, points that I didn't raise earlier on, didn't want to hog it the whole day. Um, just following on from uh, the question about Spackman House, and because I was going to raise something about um, uh, the light, sunlight and such like, but you've answered that. But it's this point about balconies and soffits and such like. I mean, you know, the reality is that they are there and they're having an effect. So anything else that adds to that adverse effect is nonetheless the reality of the situation. So going back to the theoretical, if you remove those, which you're not likely to do, it, 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 it is still there. And there is that, uh, in some cases, major adverse effect. But you've You've, you've explained that already. I had a couple of other points I want to. One is a very quick one. Um, as I get older and my hill climbing days are uh, over, is there an escalator up to the um, walkway in the um, publicly accessed path, or is it a lift, or is it just stairs? Uh, there's actually a lift uh, and some stairs. So I'm just trying to see if I can find the right image. on the floor plans maybe Yeah. 
So on this image, this is on um, uh, Wandsworth Bridge Road, uh, and that's uh, access point, which I think I was describing earlier with some stairs going up to uh, the landings on the slightly higher level, but the lift is in that location at street level, so you can get up from street level. And it's publicly accessible. It's publicly accessible, yeah. Great, thanks on that. Final question, and part question, part comment, is this uh, dreadful junction of uh, Town Mead Wandsworth Bridge Road, Carnworth Road, which has been a major issue for many, many years. Uh, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I do recall, certainly um, when I was a cabinet member covering highways and things, there was a public consultation done for of residents wanting, uh, you know, a, a green man crossing put in there. It came out 80, 90% in favour. Uh, we went through discussions with TfL, we had discussions with everybody else. Uh, everybody agreed to go ahead with it, Till uh, the the borough on the other side that owns the bridge said there would be a stacking of vehicles trying to get across, and TfL, in their wisdom, decided they wouldn't use their powers to um, uh, uh, override the objections, which they they're entitled to do. It seems to me a little bit rich now coming from them in this that they want it, but I suppose ultimately it benefits everybody if it goes ahead. So in terms of the question is when is that likely to happen? Because I don't know if I mean, you probably do know that juncture, but you try crossing that, it is an absolute nightmare from a pedestrian point of view. Um, as part of the the planning consent there's an obligation to improve the crossing facilities for pedestrians and cyclists um the, we've already as part of um consultation with um Wandsworth Bridge Road residents there has been um some you know workshops done in undertaken to design that corridor including the junction so we've got the design uh, in mind um and also have spoke to Wandsworth informally um, and as part of this development, the works would have to be completed um, prior to occupation. So within two and a half years, effectively. Okay. Okay. Any more questions, Councillor Harcourt? No, no. No? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, Councillor Carl. Um, yeah, um, following on from Councillor Harcourt, we, we tend to think the same way a lot of the time. Um, I don't know that that's quite true, Councillor. Well, the same subject areas. Um, but uh, there was no insult intended. Um, we've heard about uh, the uh, ADF uh, problems. Can you tell me why this application used ADF uh, calculations and not CBDM, which is now the accepted standard? Uh, I think because when the application was submitted, it was submitted at a time when the ADF still applied uh, and 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 as you know the bre doesn't necessarily uh, recommend uh, the, the application of adf anyway but it's used in this case just as an indicative uh, way to sort of show what the likely impact would be and it seemed to be deemed to be appropriate in this case shouldn't they have pro produced an updated report using cbdm they could have done, uh, but uh, our Daylight and Sunlight consultant was satisfied that the ADF uh, assessment was satisfactory for those purposes. Just to go home the point, drive home the point, is it is it not generally correct in well over 95% of cases that the climate-based daylight modelling uh, is a more stringent test uh, than the old ADF test? And had we had a report uh, that used uh, CBDM uh, that it was it would likely show greater transgressions. Well, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a hundred percent expert in these matters, and we rely upon a daylight and sunlight consultant. And uh, Ian Diaz is uh, very capable, and he has looked through this development at some length with the developers, uh, and he's reviewed the information they provided to us, and we're satisfied that um, his conclusions. Yeah, just, just to add to or clarify Roy's point there, I mean, in situations like this where there, obviously it's a, it's a balanced planning argument, you've got a big site on the river, it's been mentioned about the, you know, the historical kind of sites in Fulham, the industrial cheek by jowl with very low grain kind of residential and the complexities coming out of that and transportation, et cetera. 
in these circumstances, we would generally be looking for the developer to fund the appointment of a third party consultant for that for that very reason, in order to give us that extra level of comfort, because we're not experts, and you know, I have to say that you know my experience of Ian Diaz, he doesn't he knows his job. He's very sort of up to date on you know on on uh, on matters to do with daylight and sunlighting, and he's you know as you'd expect from his profession. So. It certainly helps us in terms of getting to the bottom of things. So, you know. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? No, no further questions. Okay. In that case, we'll move on to voting. <clears throat> So just to check with officers, are there any additional obligations that we should be aware of before we vote? I think we talked about earlier the uh, building control monitoring, uh, which well, that was as uh, are you talking about obligations or you so it, as well. it's the, um, the London plan's requirement that there is ongoing energy monitoring, yeah. um, which is the be seen energy monitoring. And the report also talks about the district heating network, which again will be yeah. secure, you know, um, ensuring that the, the units are connectable to a district heating network if one is provided. I think those were the two. The and in addition to that, just... Um, the report talks about early stage review and review mechanisms. I think that needs to be clarified in the section 106 as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So now we'll move on to, <clears throat> excuse me, voting. Firstly, we'll vote on whether recommendation one in the report is agreed, and that's on page 12, and that's with reference to the addendum. Uh, Councillor Chavot Verdier, will you be voting for, against, or not voting? Four. Councillor Harcourt? Four. Councillor Sustus? Four. Councillor Walsh? For. Councillor Carmel? Against. Councillor Pascu Tibure? Against. And I'll be voting for. So recommendation one has been approved. Now we vote on recommendation two in the report, which is also on page 12. Councillor Chavot Verdier? For. Councillor Harcourt? For. Councillor Sustus? For. Councillor Walsh? For. Councillor Carmel? For. Councillor Pascu Tibure? For. And I'll also be voting for. So that, um, that application has been approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Sorry? Yes, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have a five minute break. Thank you.
Okay, sorry to keep you all yet if you want to. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, now we can move on to item five, which is Fulham Cross Academy. And can I ask Tom Scriven, presenting officer, to please present the report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The application relates to Fulham Cross Academy School located on the south of Kingwood Road. Uh, and the application site consists of a number of buildings which amalgamated to historic school sites, uh, Kingwood Road School and Childerley Street School. These two schools subsequent, subsequently became uh, Henry Compton Secondary School, then Fulham College Boys School becoming, before becoming part of the Fulham uh, Cross Academy. Uh, on the opposite side of Kingwood Road, we've got residential properties here um, to the west. Actually, again. Tom, sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Can we ask for the slides to be blown up on, on the big screens, if that's possible? Thank you so much. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, on the opposite side of Kingwood Road, we've got residential properties here um, to the west of the site again residential properties and the Childerley Centre. Uh, to the south, residential properties along Lambrook Terrace. And again, to the east, we've got residential properties here. Um, and within the site itself, it contains a number of designated and non-designated heritage assets, the most prominent being the Grade 2 listed Kingwood Road block located relatively centrally within the site here. Uh, and the site is also within Flood Zone 2. In terms of the proposal itself, it's for the impro improvement of the existing school facilities. Uh, so this consists of demolition of three existing buildings, including sports and dining hall, uh, and then the subsequent remodeling and refurbishment to those remaining blo uh, blocks to be affected. And then the primary new built form is the construction of a new building containing a sports and dining hall with associated facilities. There's also other works to the site, including alterations to some boundary treatments and amendments to a historic boundary wall within the site. Uh, and then there's also landscaping and associated ancillary works. And um, as part of all this, there's an associated listed building consent application for the works of the listed building itself and the wall. It's just a couple of views uh, from around the site. So this is the view eastwards along Kingwood Road. In the foreground is one of the buildings to be demolished uh, with its associated link to the grade two listed uh, Kingwood Road block in the background. Next, we've got the view from Wyfold Road to the east of the site. Uh, the proposed building is offset to the left-hand side to try and limit the impact on this view towards the listed building in the background. And then this is the view from Childerley Street uh, to the west of the site. Uh, the modern science block is visible here on the left-hand side. Um, and then you've got, uh, again, another one of the buildings to be demolished here. So one of the more modern buildings on the site and the locally listed, uh, oh, sorry, Childerley, uh, old Childerley School there in the, uh, on the right-hand side. In terms of the demolition, um, this demolition plan shows the buildings in yellow that are going to be removed. Uh, so you've got the grade two listed building here. You've got the building that I just showed you from Kingwood Road with a further building uh, to the rear of this, which will be removed. And then the building towards the center of the site to be removed. Uh, the historic wall to be altered is here. Uh, it's in this area here to the east of this building to be demolished. Uh, it is shown a bit clearer on another plan, uh, which is coming up later. So the proposed building would be located towards the east of the site where there would be uh, where there's an existing area of hard standing used as a play area. Uh, so it's this building in here. Uh, the majority of trees would be retained on site. However, we've got some red circles here which indicate uh, two existing trees which will need to be removed to make way for the building. Across the remainder of the site, you can see that uh, the demolition of buildings shown on the previous slide opens up space for additional landscaping, particularly here in the center of the site. Uh, as well as allowing for the creation of the replacement uh, play area here to the west of the site. And then just on this comparison plan, again, you can see the buildings to be demolished in red. They're then outlined in red here uh, in comparison to what's being uh, proposed. Um, so, yeah, again, you can see this area here is going to be landscaped. This is the new hard play area. 
this is in red here. Hopefully you can just see uh, the annotation of where the existing uh, wall is going to be removed. And then again, the two trees to be removed in here. Just quickly go through the floor plans for the new building. Um, so this shows the ground floor of the building. Uh, it contains a dining hall and associated kitchen facilities on the left-hand side, and then the new sports hall on the right-hand side. First floor level, uh, there's much more limited space because of the double height uh, sports hall area, but you've got associated uh, facilities uh, across the rest of the first floor level, and including toilets and changing facilities. And then at roof level, the proposal includes plants serving the building along with air source heat pumps, uh, solar panels and areas of green roof, which would all contribute towards the overall sustainability of the scheme. And then just quickly on the elevations. So this is the north elevation facing towards Kingwood Road in the existing sixth form block. The south elevation faces towards the multi-use game area. Uh, on these elevations, you can see the contrast between the brick cladding to be used on the building, as well as the variation in the cladding itself to try and break up the visual bulk of the building. Uh, similar with the side elevations here. There's then um, some CGI images. So the top two images here are from the um, sort of courtyard area centrally within the building, um, looking towards, so that side of the building here and here is facing inwards towards the grade two listed building. Uh, these two images here in the middle, these are the north side of the building. So you can see the corner of the sixth form block here, and this is the, um, the gap between those two buildings. And then uh, down the bottom, we've got, we're essentially here stood in the area where that building is to be removed in the middle of the site. So you can see the indicative landscaping in here. And then finally, um, the view from the road, again, it, it just showing it in relation to the existing sixth form block. So you can see the building uh, just behind it here. And then uh, just some plans showing the landscaping, which forms an important part of the proposals with 41 trees being planted on the site, along with the retention of the majority of the existing trees, other than those that I previously mentioned. Uh, the key areas of additional landscaping are where the demolition of the existing buildings has provided additional opportunities on the site, particularly the case uh, on the west-hand side, uh, sorry, the west side, uh, near to the new play area. And then if we just go to the next one, and again, that area centrally in the site, uh, just showing that additional landscaping. And then finally, in summary, uh, principal development is considered to be accepted as the proposal represents the improvement and enhancement of uh, existing educational facilities. There will also be a wider benefit through the provision of an improved facility which is available for community use and this will be secured through a community use agreement. The demolition of the existing buildings would improve the visual appearance of the remaining buildings on site including the listed building uh, and in design terms it's considered that any less than substantial harm associated with the new building would be outweighed by the public benefits. Uh, the loss of the two existing trees on site has been shown to be necessary in order to facilitate the proposed building, which cannot be cited elsewhere in the site, and needs to be this size in order to accommodate the necessary facilities. Uh, the full reasoning and justification for this is set out in paragraph 9.2 on page 203 of the report. Uh, and then in addition to this, the landscaping scheme includes the planting of 41 trees, which would contribute towards a significant improvement in biodiversity and urban greening factor on the site. Uh, with regards to neighbouring immunity, daylight and sunlight assessment was submitted with the proposal, considered the impacts would fall within acceptable limits. Uh, particular attention has been paid to the sustainability and energy efficiency of the scheme with significant use of renewable energy in line with the council priorities regarding uh, the climate emergency. Subject to conditions, the proposal is considered to be acceptable in relation to other material considerations. Um, there's no further updates to the report, and the recommendation is to approve the application and the associated listed building consent subject to conditions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And sorry, I should have said that that report covers both item five and item six. Okay, so now we can call on Matthew Blythin, who is speaking in support of this application. Matthew, whenever you're ready, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, members. Um, 
As Mr. Scrivens just set out, um, but just to reiterate, this application seeks to secure much needed and important replacement sports and dining facilities for Fulham Cross Academy. The school's existing provision is outdated and beyond its useful life, falling significantly below the standards that any school should reasonably expect. In contrast, these proposals will deliver high quality facilities that the pupils need and deserve. We've worked very closely with officers throughout the pre-application process to develop a design which responds positively to the site's context and constraints whilst delivering the facilities needed. The existing sports and dining provision has to remain operational until the new building is completed and ready for use, after which they'll be demolished to make way for additional external play and landscaped areas. The siting of the new building has been dictated by the need to preserve neighbouring amenity, views towards and the setting of the main listed building. This and the detailed design of the building is supported by the conservation officer, also recognising the benefits of demolishing the existing unsightly sports building, which will far better reveal the attractive list of building within the local streetscape, as the images um, you've just seen uh, present very well. The proposals include a green roof and new planting across the site, helping to achieve all requirements regarding urban greening and biodiversity net gain. Solar panels on the new building, alongside associated plans for solar panels and other existing buildings on site, also ensure the development will be net zero carbon. The proposed development will not only benefit the school, but the local community as well, being available for community use outside of school hours. Whilst this does not represent any change to the existing situation, local sports clubs and other users will get the benefits of vastly improved facilities. The development does not result in any increase of staff or pupil numbers with no changes proposed to access or parking arrangements from existing. So in summary, the application is the result of constructive engagement with officers and other consultees throughout and will deliver high quality, sympathetically designed and sustainable new facilities for the school and its pupils in full accordance with policy. We therefore hope that members will support the positive recommendation for approval. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, now we can move on to questions for officers and I can see Councillor Carmel. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, for, firstly, can I just say this is in my ward and I fully support uh, this application. The only question I've uh, got is over the construction because uh, down down Childerley Street is my polling station uh, and I want to make sure that uh, uh, whether the construction route will uh, mean... Uh, uh, could I suspect we might be having an election sometime soon. Um, might mean that uh, w uh, I have to inform electoral services that they need a new polling station. Um, so there was an outline construction logistics plan submitted with the application reviewed by highways, uh, but they have asked for a more detailed one as part of um, you know, any approval. So uh, I suppose when it comes to that being submitted, um, we can possibly advise on the proposed routes um, to, to assist you if you do need to take action. If you could send it to me when it's, um, when it's received, I'd be grateful. Okay, Councillor Walsh. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I'm very pleased to see the level and focus of uh, climate mitigation and also the, the consciousness of the climate emergency in this development. I think it's a real positive for sort of models that are to be used for other uh, redevelopments uh, across the borough. Um, obviously, it's a disappointment to see that there is two trees having to be removed from uh, the site as part of this application. And it's good to see that there is 41 new trees coming in place. Um, from an, one of the obligations also we have as a borough is to focus on uh, ecology, uh, particularly for wildlife in the borough. And I'd like to know if there's any British native species of trees being um, included as part of that 41 new trees, uh, particularly as British native trees would be far more beneficial than that of uh, non-traditional uh, or non-native uh, trees in support of our borough's wildlife. Yes, so there has been a planting schedule which has been sent in as part of the application um, and that has been re reviewed by our ecology officers who are very mindful of the need to uh, focus more on native species and as part of the negotiations during the application we did ensure that a number of native species 
were included within the planting and the ecology officer um, did confirm that overall there was a focus on native planting which is beneficial for wildlife so they confirmed that uh, the planting that is being proposed is appropriate and, and does meet those requirements. Okay, Councillor um, Harcourt. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, yeah, like Councillor Carmel, I'm quite happy to support this application. But uh, firstly, what, what's, uh, is there a percentage of loss of open space on the site as a result of the new building or is, or is the whole thing back even uh, yes yeah, sorry i don't have the percentage um to hand but given that three buildings are being demolished um I, I would say yeah and looking at it just just on the basis if we go to that comparison plan so you can see the sort of footprint of the red buildings which are the ones to be removed compared to i know it's maybe harder to see uh, on this drawing, but compared to the proposed building, I, I think we're yeah we're pretty no, much neutral overall. But then a lot of hard standing is being removed. So I think in terms of hard standing, we've got we've ended up with a lot more landscaping uh, as a result of this scheme compared to a site which currently is pretty much all buildings and hard standing. And you, um, despite the loss of two trees, which you're not particularly happy with. Understand that what is, but nonetheless, you know, BNG of uh, fifty six percent and such like is very, very good. And the other thing, which is extremely positive, is this comes out not just at net carbon zero, but actually overproducing and um, generating excess electricity. So a very positive thing there. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Oh, no further questions. Okay. And. In that case, we'll move on to voting. Firstly, on whether recommendation one is agreed, and that's on page 171. Councillor Chafort Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. In favour. Councillor Soustus. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascu Tiburi. Four. And I'll also be voting four. So that recommendation has been approved. Now we move on to recommendation two, which is also on page 171. Councillor Chafort Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Four. Councillor Soustus. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascu Tiberi. Four. And I'll also be voting four. So that application has been approved. We move on to item six, which is the listed building consent and recommendation one, which is on page 220. Councillor Chavot Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Uh, four. Councillor Tuslus. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascu Tiberi. Four. Uh, and I'll also be voting four. And recommendation two, which is also on page 220, Councillor Chavot Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Four. Councillor Soustus. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascu Tiburi. Four. And I'll also be voting four. So that application and the listed building consent have been approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we move on to item seven, Fulham Gas Works. And can I please call the presenting officer, Jacques Duplessis, to introduce the report? And, uh, sorry? Yes, exactly. So just to clarify, the report will cover both applications, item seven and item eight.
Thank you, Jay. Apologies, I was thrown out of the meeting. Um, Firstly, I would like to draw members' attention to the addendum uh, where a second officer recommendation has been added to the listed building consent application. It is a duplicate of the second recommendation on the full application, which authorizes officers in consultation with the chair to make minor changes to the heads of terms and conditions post committee. The application site is the former Fulham Gasworks site, which can be seen here etched in red. The site has been cleared, as you can see, apart from retaining the heritage assets. If we look at the heritage as assets on site, um, there are several grade two and one grade two star listed. Um, if you look at the darker color uh, to the north here, you could see the gas holder number two. Um, to the middle here is the chief engineer's office and to the south is the research laboratory. To the west of these two buildings lies two war memorials. Um, just as some background, planning permission was permitted in 2019 uh, for a mixed-use residential-led development known as Kings Road Park, comprising of up to 1,800 residential units set around a public park. Um, a new square will hold the listed buildings and war memorials in this location. In terms of progress on site, uh, you can see there the red line. Um, this is phase one that's mostly completed and mostly occupied. And currently under construction is these two buildings, D1, D2, which will deliver 128 affordable homes. And commencement has also started on the buildings to the north. The applications that we're discussing today is uh, the, the officer's report assesses two applications, the first being the full planning commission for the demolition of the existing modern brick plinth to the World War II memorial and salvage of the plaque and frame, erection of a new stone plinth for the display of the salvaged World War II plaque and frame, plus the reassembly of the dismantled grade two listed War Memorial One. Uh, both memorials will be located in a new public space within the Kings Road Park development. The listed building consent seeks permission for the dismantling of the great two listed First World War Memorial and is refurbished and reassembly in the new location. Here you can see both memorials to the west of the, the listed office building. The memorials commemorate employees of the former Gaslight and Coke Company who died in the World War I and II. The, looking at the listed memorial, it comprises of two plaques, two bronze plaques. To the, the one at the top is uh, World War I names, and the one to the bottom is World War II names, with a total names of 549. In 1922, the company commissioned three duplicate plaques to be located at their work sites in Beckton, another in Brentford, and this one in Fulham. If we look at the non-listed memorial, um, it comprises of 402 names, um, and in 1948, the company erected duplicate World War II plaques in its head showrooms in Church Street, Kensington, and one at Watson House in Fulham. In 1999, this World War II plaque was, with classic frame, was relocated from Watson House in Fulham to the current site. If you look at this image, it shows the location of the, the square where the memorials were moved to. And if you could recall, the current location is just slightly to the north. The memorial garden forms part of the larger Sanzin Square and is designed as a formal setting for the memorials featuring a simple lawn framed with pleached trees, seating and formal planting with views through to the listed 1927 building, which could be seen in the background there. The World War One to the left, and the World War Two memorial lies to the right, which you could see in this CGI. In compositioning these structures, consideration has been given to their orientation and providing generous circulation space for any commemorative ceremonies. Got another CGI here. Um, in terms of representations received on public consultation, no representations has been received from neighbours. Uh, Historic England reviewed the proposals and confirmed that they have no comments to make.
Uh, we will have a section 106 attached to any approval, which would ensure that there's an obligation to re return the memorials post storage and refurbishment. Then the proposals are considered to be well designed in relation to their context and would not cause any harm to the significance of designated or non-designated heritage assets or their setting in accordance with policy. Officers recommend that members resolve to approve both applications subject to no contrary direction from the Secretary of State in accordance with the officer's recommendations, which can be seen on screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions for officers? No. No questions for officers? Okay. Great. In that case, we move on to voting uh, on recommendation one, which is on page 257. Uh, Councillor Chafot Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Four. Councillor Suslus. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascoe Tiberi. Four. And I'll also be voting four. Now we move on to recommendation two, which is also on page 257. Councillor Chavot Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Four. Councillor Suslus. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascoe Tiberi. Four. And I'll also be voting four. So that application has been approved. Now I move on to item eight, which is the listed building consent. Um, on recommendation one, which is on page 274, Councillor Chavot Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Four. Councillor Suslis. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascu Tiberi. Four. I'll also be voting four. And now we vote on the second recommendation, which was included in the addendum, which is also on page 274, Councillor Chavot Verdier. Four. Councillor Harcourt. Councillor Suslis. Four. Councillor Walsh. Four. Councillor Carmel. Four. Councillor Pascu Tiberi. Four. I'll also be voting four and uh, that application and listed building consent have been approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we move on to item nine, which is confirmation of tree preservation order. And Alan, will you be presenting the report? Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. So just um, this is confirmation of a tree preservation order um, in relation to four trees. Um, to the rear of properties at 9 to 13 Brackenbury Road. Um, you can see on the plan here, this is the location of the four um, sycamore trees on a plan. I'll just talk through the um, the actual some photographs of the trees to show those now and then just talk through the consultation material on the on the, um, the provisional TPO. So again, the, the reason the TPO is made is in part because of the fact we've received a, a notification under the section 211 notice to fell the tree and as a consequence have decided to um, make a, a provisional TPO which is subject to public engagement. Um, so these are the trees in question, just some photographs. These photographs obviously are taken um, when the trees are not in leaf because they're, they're quite recent, but just so you can see the trees in situ. Um, and this is the view from Brackenbury Road of the trees um, within that wider kind of purview. Um, I've just taken a snapshot from from mapping just to show kind of how that looks when the trees are in leaf. Um, the officer's recommendation is to um, to confirm the TPO, um, and the reason it's before before members today, sorry, is because we've received one objection um, from one of the residents at Eleven A Brackenbury Road um, to the tree in terms of its impact of being a, a risk to residents and guests to that property. We've also received three letters in support um, in, in relation to the um, confirmation of the TPO from other residents in the adjacent properties. Um, so the, the officer re recommendation is to um, say to confirm the TPO. I think in terms of the, the objections received, it's just to be clear, the, the objection relates to um, a branch falling off the tree onto the patio of 11A Brackenbury Road. Um, the, the the confirmation of the TPO would not um, prohibit future works to the tree. Um, Parding or pruning of the trees could be undertaken subject to appropriate notifications of the council. Um, and also in future, if the, the trees do become problematic in terms of health and safety or other risks, um, there is a provision in place to allow for the trees to be felled subject to suitable justification again through the same process of an application. The confirmation of the TPO is quite helpful in terms of the fact that it gives the council more um, powers in terms of seeking a suitable replacement of any felled tree in future. 
Um, for those reasons, alongside the, the considerable amenity value of these trees, I say officer recommendation is to recommend the, the confirmation. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No question. Yes, Councillor Hockle? Yeah, three to one in favour. <laughs> okay, <you>. great. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, okay, if there are no other questions, then yeah. <laughs> Very good. We'll move on to voting on the one and only recommendation, which is on page 277. Uh, Councillor Shavot Verdi? Four. Councillor Harcourt? Four. <clears throat> Councillor Suslis? Four. Councillor Walsh? Four. Councillor Carmel? Four. Councillor Pascu Tiburi? Four. Now also be voting four. So that has been approved. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of the meeting. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending or watching tonight's meeting. The draft minutes will be published on our website shortly and will be formally approved at the next meeting, which is on the 5th of March, 2024. And if you have any questions or queries in the meantime, please contact the case officer in the application report. Thank you.